Okay, so as Samantha has already mentioned, my talk today is on in-situ SCM testing methodologies coupled with digital image correlation. And this is predominantly using a series of images which you can acquire within the SCM. So what exactly is digital image correlation? DIC is a method that compares a change in grayscale intensity in the specimen in its undeformed to deformed state in order to create stain maps, either in plane to map in plane deformation in 2D or out of plane deformation in 3D. This technique is contactless in nature and has a relatively simple setup and has shown tremendous potential in research ventures as well as industrial applications. So the DIC technique was first discovered, invented in the early 1980s by a series of researchers at the University of South Carolina, but it only started to really gain popularity after 2005. So here on the graph to the right, you can see that after 2005, the number of publications actually using the DIC technique rose exponentially. Whereas other techniques to either measure strain or map strain either maintained their popularity throughout the years or slightly decreased in popularity. So before using the DIC technique and relying on the grayscale variation in images as a specimen was formed, researchers were either mapping strain simply by mapping a grid on the material and then looking at the local distortion of the grid or using fringe patterns as shown here in which deformation is measured by recording the phase differences of a scattered light wave before and after deformation. So for this talk today, I'll be predominantly focusing on 2D DIC. So as for the relatively simple setup, so you have your specimen to which you want to intensify the grayscale variation using some sort of speckle pattern. Then you have your light source that you are assuming is has even in a stable illumination throughout the deformation process. And as the material is deformed, a series of images are captured with a CCD camera. And then these images get processed with the DIC software in some sort of computer. And that is how we create the strain maps. So to look at the front view of such specimen, you can see that there's the underlying speckle pattern. And then in the post-processing stage, the user has to assign different parameters such as facet size, facet step, in order to get uh, the strain maps. And I'll go into more detail as to what exactly facet size and step, facet step actually means in DIC software. So this is a sort of output which you can obtain from DIC, where images are acquired using a fast or ultra fast CCD camera. So you're capturing deformation at the micro scale regime. Um, the ultimate benefit of using DIC is that you can see strain localization. So for example, here, we know that deformation is being concentrated at this point right here. So we're getting necking at this region. So we'll have a lot of deformation and damage here, followed by fracture. So some advantages of 2D DIC is that the methodology can be coupled with pretty much any imaging system. So you can deform a material under a light optical microscope, an SEM, an AFM, and an STM, and then post-process these images with DIC. So for in-plane and capturing in-plane deformation, so that is 2D DIC, no laser source is required. And as well, when looking at a larger uh, field of view, it's relatively simple to apply a speckle pattern, either using paint or airbrushing or some sort of toner pattern. This becomes more complicated and more of a challenge when looking at a smaller field of view and trying to capture microscopic deformation. So just to further emphasize the versatility of the 2D DIC technique, I'm showing here on the right, this image shows a novel three-point bending testing setup adapted for DIC. So as the material is being bent, the bent surface is being captured by the special mirror, and then whatever is reflected from the special mirror special mirror is being captured by the CCD camera. And then here we have our light source. So this setup has been done at CAMSI by Dr. Mike Bruthis in collaboration with PhD candidate Nizia. So some assumptions as well as limitations to be cognizant of when doing 2D DIC. The assumption number one that is being made is that the specimen is remaining parallel to the CCD sensor throughout the deformation process. As well, it is assumed that the imaging system does not suffer dynamic 
spectrometric distortion, meaning that the physical point on the specimen matches the physical point on the image. And there's like pre pretty close linear correspondence between the two. Strain measurement is heavily dependent on the imaging system. Strain measurement accuracy using the 2D DIC method is lower than that of interferometric techniques, such as the fringe pattern, as I showed in the previous slide. And you're assuming that stable and even illumination is applied during loading. And then lastly, I have the speckle preparation again as a limitation because when looking at a smaller field of view, this becomes more of a challenge. So now I'm going to go through applying DIC on a series of images acquired from an SEM. So one of the most common methods of speckle patterning for SEM acquisition is by etching the microstructure. So to go through the re relative methodology and applying this to tensile testing, but you could use any sort of deformation process. So for example, you have a microtensile specimen. You take a microtensile specimen and you deform it under the SEM and you take images at a focused location. So again, using that etched microstructure, we get a good local grayscale variation, which we can use to our benefit to process in a DIC software and get strain maps at the microscopic level. Meaning that once we get our strain maps, we can actually identify phases that are deforming most and then the phases that are deforming least. So areas that are experiencing high strain and areas that are experiencing low strain. So in specific to our capabilities at the CCEM, we have a larger automatic in-situ tensile frame, which is suitable for the Joel 6610. Because this is an automatic tensile stage, we have the ability to track the force displacement data using our MTES Quattro software. The load capacity of this tensile frame is 4,500 newtons. So I've been successfully able to pull very ultra high strength 3G steels with this material, just to give you a gauge of how strong this stage is. Um, as well, we have the uh, heating stage set up here, and I'll talk to you about that uh, later on in the presentation. But now that the industry is developing these advanced materials with ultra fine grain sizes, such as um, fine grain steels, the overall objective is to get microstrain maps that have very high spatial resolution. So ultimately, if you want to use the 7000, which has a much smaller chamber, we have developed a manual tensile stage, which fits quite nicely. And you can get very close to the pull piece and very close to the in-lens detector to get to those high resolution images for microstrain mapping. As well, what has been done in the past on aluminum materials is in situ V-bend testing on the 6610. So this is a manual jig again, which is screw driven, and then you can map the through thickness strain and image at an area of interest. So that now the, most of the talk will be focusing on processing images acquired from a small field of view. So that is using an SEM in order to get microstructural level strain map. So micro DIC, the concept of looking at strain partitioning at the micro scale was first introduced and applied under Dr. Wilkinson's group. Dr. Zhidong Kang was the primary author of the following publication, which was first um, released in 2005 on an automotive aluminum alloy sheet. And then, as I showed in the previous one of the previous slides, after 2005, the number of publications using the DIC technique just exponentially increased. So this work was also in collaboration with Dr. David Embury, as well as Dr. Makesh Jain. And since then, the DIC technique has been applied to various industries. So for example, it has been applied to study ballistic impact loading of a 3D CFRP braided structure in which they use the natural braided structure for digital image correlation. It has also been applied in the geological field in order to map 3D strain characterization of coal. It has been applied in the biomedical field to look at polymer shrinkage in dental composites. It has also been applied on metal nanofilms of flexible electronics. And the list goes on and on, but this is a setup that has been done specifically at the CANSI to look at the compaction of powders and that 
is, of course, DIC applied to the powder metallurgical field. So there are some fundamentals and some processes to be cognizant of during DIC. So in digital image correlation, it's very important that you're taking images with very small increments of strain. What happens in digital image correlation is that there's this cross criterion correlation coefficient, which is pretty much just the sliding dot product. So if you have a large strain increment between the underformed to the deformed stage, this dot product approaches zero, in which you get no correlation in the in the uh, undeformed map. So you get like a dark, a dark area in the map. Whereas if the degree of similarity between the undeformed facet and the deformed facet is quite close, then this dot product approaches one, and then you will get mapping coverage. So I'll show you some examples of that later on. Another important parameter of post-processing with DIC are facets. So facets are virtual gauge boxes that compares a reference condition to a series of deformed condition. And a facet is the size of box that the user chooses that has a set of unique grayscale values. So ultimately, when choosing a facet size, you want to have your facet to have a wide variation of grayscale values that are helpful for tracking in the deformed state. So whatever deformation happens to the facet in the deformed state, that gets subtracted in the software, and that is how the strain or the displacement field is calculated. So this publication here to the right actually showed this quite nicely, where they edged the microstructure and then mapped on a subset facet size of 21 by 21 pixels, and they found that there was a wide variety of grayscale from 5 to 25 in just this small pixel right here. So in other terms, facet size is the dimension in pixel that the user sets to compute the average strain. So if you really don't care about the ingrained strain, and you want to get a more robust calculation of the strain using DIC software, you would choose a greater facet size. But if you care about localized strain and capturing local deformation, you would choose a smaller facet size. Another important parameter to facet size is facet step. In some DIC softwares, this is termed as point distance, and that is just the degree of overlap between facets or the distance between facet centers in pixels. Again, this is adjustable by the user. A decrease in the point distance results in an increase in the spatial density. However, there is a limitation to this. There is noise in the computation which can accumulate when the strain gauge or the virtual strain gauge is short in comparison to the surface roughness. So here on the right, I'm showing a somatic in which you have 0% overlap, and we have this virtual strain gauge. So in, for a virtual strain gauge, you have to at least have two facet steps. So this is the start and this is the end. As I increase the degree of overlap, you can see that the virtual strain gauge length decreases. And then as I increase the overlap even more, the virtual strain gauge decreases even more. So this study here, they particularly wanted to focus on, okay, when doing DIC post-processing, what is more important, choosing the facet size or choosing the facet step? And in the end, they found that choosing the facet step was quite important. So first, what they did is they kept the facet step constant and changed the facet size. And they found that by increasing the facet size, there is a decrease in the spatial resolution. But this was more pronounced when changing the point distance. So when changing the point distance or the facet step from one to three to 10, by keeping the facet size constant, they found that there is a decrease in the spatial resolution and it was quite significant in comparison to changing just the facet size. As well, another important parameter with a DIC post-processing is the computation size. It is the number of facet centers used for the strain computation. So in DIC post-processing, you define a strain rosette. The reason why we use strain rosettes is so that we can define major and minor strains, which are necessary to compute things like the von Mises strain or map von Mises strain, which is highly used to map um, micro strain in the forming of materials. So the DIC software default is to use a 
computation size of three. So you have a three by three facet size and a two by two facet step. So this is the size of your initial virtual gauge length in the major and minor directions. If you want to create a more robust calculation, a technique you could use is increase the computation size. So for example, if you increase your computation size to five, in which you have a five by five facet size, a four by four facet step size, you see that now you're increasing your virtual gauge length in both the major and minor directions. So overall, if you choose a facet size that is less than the default value of the DIC software, the accuracy of the resulting measuring point decreases, the computation time increases. However, you then get to capture these local effects much better. If you choose a facet step that is less than the default value in the DIC software, the measuring point density increases, the computation time also increases, but the overlapping areas up to 50% are still suitable for representing quite measurable results. So the, to put this in a more uh, globalized sense, if you want a robust calculation and you don't really care again about the ingrain strain, you would choose a facet size and a facet step that is greater than the average grain size of the material. However, in instances such as the Wilkinson Research Group, in which we do all of our experimentation in order to eventually formulate high fidelity models of damage and failure, we need to resolve strains at length scales smaller than the constituent, meaning that we at least need to have a three by three facet of computation size within the average grain size of the material in order to resolve these in grain strains. So in DIC, there's also two different types of computation. We have our conventional computation and our incremental computation. So conventional computation is taking every image and it is correlated to the reference image. So every deformed state is correlated to the undeformed state. However, in the incremental computation method, which is more suited for higher global strains in which we start to get these features of deformation in the microstructure, Every image is used as an updated reference image to this successive image. So the correlation is done with the previous image, not to the undeformed state as done with the conventional DIC computation method. So in the following the uh, publication, they actually compared the two correlation methods of computation in which they found that by using the incremental correlation, you're actually able to either fill in spots that was not possible with the conventional method. And as well, if you decrease the facet size, these spots in which you had decorrelation, you can actually see the local strain effects. So there are a series of systematic uh, errors as well as precision and accuracy errors associated with uh, DIC experimentation as well as post-processing. So errors related to the specimen loading and imaging include non-parallel CCD camera target and specimen, any image distortion, noise resulting from the image acquisition as well as speckle preparation. With careful calibration, you can I, you can minimize the effects of the first three errors. There are also errors related to the computation. So this is toward, more towards the post-processing of a series of images that you've collected during deformation. And that includes choosing a appropriate facet size and an appropriate facet step, having the appropriate correlation function, subpixel algorithm, and interpolation scheme. So you don't have much of a choice over these three bottom errors that is usually inherent to the software. And with careful calibration, you can get these three errors to be minimized. So what the major portion is to focus on during DIC experimentation and post-processing is having an adequate facet size and facet step to capture the deformation that you want. And that is highly dependent on the speckle and how you prepare your speckle. So with that being said, now I'm going to go more in depth on microspeckling guidelines and basics. So that is looking now at a smaller field of view and mapping strain at the microstructural to nanoscale level. 
So the first guideline is that you want a randomized pattern. So here you can achieve a randomized pattern quite easily by using the microstructure and etching. And then there are benefits to having a non-randomized pattern, but overall you do want a randomized pattern. Secondly, you want a grayscale pattern with good contrast and brightness to be able to follow the deformation of the specimen to very high global screens. So ultimately you want a ratio between light and dark that is 50 and 50. If you don't have a good light to dark ratio, and for example, you have high contrast in your images, you're decreasing the probability of getting a facet with a unique set of grayscale values. So for example, you may get a facet within this dark area in which you have all of your pixels being dark rather than having a unique set of grayscale values. Some other basic guidelines include having a speckle density from 25 to 50% area fraction. This is quite subjective in the literature. Uh, many literature sources say to have 25% and then others say to have 50% area fraction. I think it's also highly dependent on your field of view. The speckles should have curved edges. So in this publication right here, they looked at the effect of having squared speckles. So during SEM rostering, it was found that noise was accumulating at the straight edges of these squared speckles. As a result, that was reflected in the SEM image and then transferred over to the microstrain map. So you're getting a falsified strain uh, localization in these areas. You want your speckles to have compatible deformation with the underlying substrate. Ultimately, you want to be able to pull your substrate, deform it to very high strains, and not have these speckles flake off or crack. And as well, you want these speckles to be non-reflective. So we can actually segregate microspeckle patterning into two different types. So we have microstructure dependent speckling or imaging, and we have microstructure independent speckling or imaging. So microstructure dependent imaging is highly dependent on the microstructure. So that entails etching of the microstructure or using the natural surface topography. Or as microstructure independent imaging, you're relying on some sort of artificial texturizing of the material in order to track strain as the material is deformed. It also is very important to be cognizant of the detector which you are using to acquire images during in situ uh, testing with these sort of deformation techniques. So if you're using an SE detector, it's important to note that there may be some shadowing that may add to noise in the microstrain map. And then if you're using an in-lens detector, you're just focusing on the topography of the sample. So you won't get as much of a shadowing effect. So for microstructure independent imaging, as I've mentioned before, we can either focus on the natural topography or etching of the microstructure. So in aluminum, it has been widely used. The precipitates in the sample has quite a contrasting feature to the underlying substrate. And as a result, you can use those precipitates as the DIC tracking um, during post-processing. As well, etching. etching has been used widely in dual phase steels because you have only two phases, which are quite differently, and you can actually identify strain partitioning between the Martin site and the fair. And this has been used very, very extensively in the literature. So as for examples of independent imaging, so that is using a, applying a speckle pattern to the material that has nothing to do with the underlying microstructure, examples include randomized fib hole milling, as well as nanoparticle patterning with gold or platinum. So here, this is an example of e-beam lithography of gold. And this is an example of fib deposition with tungsten. And the list goes on and on. There's multiple different ways to pattern a material with a smaller field of view. But examples also include colloidal silica dispersion, thin film patterning, UV lithography, as well as template patterning. So I've put together a series of case studies that I either have worked on personally or has been recently investigated in the literature in terms of different microspeckle patterning techniques to map uh, microstrain. So we have used the microstructure dependent technique 
um, of etching to investigate the interface of this additively manufactured material and joint material, in which we have this martensitic stainless 420 steel and this more corrosion resistant uh, Corax material, in which it was subjected to heat treatment in order to improve the reliability of the interface. So it was found It was found during deformation that we did improve the reliability of the interface with heat treatment because most of the deformation was occurring in the 420 more ductile area rather than directly at the interface. So that was the benefit of the technique. As for the Michael's Preckle pattern and the usage of etching, because we had this highly corrosion resistant material on one side and this less corrosion resistant material on the other, etching was on uniform at the first few tries. So this required multiple trials as well as um, getting a more even distribution of the etching at the interface. So we had to do things such as angling, uh, drying, if it wasn't possible to obtain a more even etch throughout this interface, then it would have been necessary to have two forms of microspeckling on the material. So for example, we could have continued with the etching on the 420 stainless steel, but may have to use, for example, fib patterning on the highly corrosion resistant Corax material. We've also used the etching technique to look at harmonic structures. So in this structure, we looked specifically at the fine grain network shell in relation to the coarse grain region core, in which it was found during deforming the material that the network shell barely showed any deformation. And eventually at high global strains, we saw that damage was occurring around the core on the network shell and a significant amount of deformation was occurring within the core. So these decorrelated areas represent the areas of damage in the material. As well, you're able to quantify with DIC software that there is quite a significant amount of strain partition between the network core, the network shell, and the core of the material. So the second case study, and this is an extensively used study of microstructure independent speckling, is the fabrication of gold markers using e-beam lithography. So just a review of the technique, and I actually have done this previously to look at 3G materials. So first you spin coat the sample, and in my case, I use a PMMA polymer resist, and I spin coated this sample just within the necking region of my microtensile specimens. Then an e-beam is used to map out the pattern that I wanted, and I wanted a series of crosshairs. And then lastly, the material was subjected to chemical development as well as exposure, followed by metal deposition and liftoff to ultimately give this final structure of a series of non-randomized gold crosshairs. So in the end, Video's not playing. Well, anyway, in the end, there is seen that the contrast between the speckles and the underlying microstructure was okay. However, in areas where we did not, we were not able to deposit a crosshair, the underlying microstructure showed very weak contrast. So as a result, right from the get-go, we got decorrelated areas. So this study was inspired by previous work done in 2007, in which it was found that the underlying microstructure can actually be beneficial to mapping local strain with very small global strain increments. Whereas the e-beam lithography technique of patterning a series of crosshairs on the material in the grid pattern was beneficial to mapping local strain at very high global strains in which they started to see void nucleation in the microstructure or new features as a result of deformation. There is a limiting factor with using the EBL technique in which the martensitic islands or any phase for that matter is greater than the size of the grid. So instead of getting in strain local strain, we were getting something a little bit more averaged out. 
So the colloidal silica dispersion technique using the drop casting method is another case study that is, again, a microstructure independent. So it's not dependent on the microstructure of the material. And it is widely used after EBSD. So for doing EBSD, you need to have a flat and even surface. And then post that, if you want to study the deformation of the material, you need to apply some sort of speckle pattern. And what is widely used is this drop casting colloidal silica technique. So just to review the technique, first you need to obtain a clean polishing cloth and apply a series of OPS onto the polishing cloth. Then you lightly press your sample onto the cloth and rotate for however long. The rotation is to ultimately get a more even distribution of the colloidal silica throughout your area of interest. That is followed by water flushing. And the ultimate reason for repeated water flushing is so that you can eliminate those more larger agglomerates from the microstructure or even help break down those larger agglomerates. And then lastly, you water flush the material again, followed by ethanol and dry with air. So what has been seen in the literature is that by nanoparticle patterning, you can actually get some more more arrangement in the EBSD area. So with nanoparticle patterning in a non-EBSD area, you see that there is a more, there's a better distribution of grayscale values, whereas in the EBSD area, there's higher contrast. So again, that is not ideal for DIC equals processing. So the other technique that has been widely used and I have personally used in my own PhD research is randomized fib hole milling in which you are drilling, you are milling a series of randomized holes and that is your speckle pattern. The advantage of this and being used at the CCM is that we were able to actually locate exactly where we wanted to place our holes. As well, we were able to get speckles up down to 50 nanometers in size for this ultra fine grained material. There is, however, an effect to looking using an in lens versus an ET detector with the 6610. So, when using the in lens detector, there was very little contrast between the speckles as well as the underlying microstructure, which made the IC post processing much more difficult. Whereas with the ET detector, now we were getting much more severe uh, contrast in the underlying microstructure and the speckles. And as a result of that, that was also quite difficult to do the post processing. Processing. However, there are benefits to this technique as well. So another FIB technique for microspeckling, which is again non, uh, it, which is independent of the microstructure and is uh, artificially produced, is tungsten speckling or um, platinum speckling. So ultimately, you want to choose a speckle deposition material that has a different atomic number from the underlying microstructure. So the tungsten showed a very high contrast in comparison to the steel substrate. And as a result, um, we saw some shadowing using a SUSI detector or an ET detector. However, when using an in-lens detector, we saw less effect of shadowing. And as a result, you see some electron transparency from the um, speckles. So this technique, although useful as well, you need to play around with the KV in order to make sure that your speckles are not electron transparent during imaging and during deformation. So the last case study that I've put together is the electropolishing technique. So again, just a review of electropolishing, you have your specimen to which is the anode, and then you have your cathode. On the right here, the cathode is this beaker right here. You apply a voltage in order to force atoms off of the anode, your test piece onto the cathode. And as a result of doing that, you're getting a more even surface finish and you're removing that subsurface damage. So that is what is typically done in some sort of electrolyte, which is kind of material dependent. This is a technique that is typically done in order to get very highly um, spatially resolved EBSD maps and very nice EBSD indexing. So in terms of applying a voltage and what that does to the current, you apply a voltage to your test piece to extract off those atoms from the test piece onto the cathode. And as you're doing that, you draw some sort of current. So ultimately you want to apply a voltage 
that is high enough that you get into this polishing regime. So in this study, they showed they looked at a two-step electropolishing technique. So step one, they electropolished the material so that they were actually polishing the material and getting very faint delineation of the grain boundaries and getting a very tight distribution of grayscale values, which is necessary for good EBSD mapping. And then in order for, to do DIC imaging, you needed some sort of speckle pattern. So as a result of that, they took the material back to the electropolishing stage, applied a voltage that was even higher than the previous step, and resulted in some pitting of the material. So then you have some features in the material necessary for DIC tracking. And that as well increased the grayscale distribution, which is also necessary for DIC tracking. The challenge with this method is that once you have pitting in the material, you can no longer do EBSD and get a reliable EBSD map. So you're losing microstructural information where the pits are. As well, you are actually degrading the EBSD mapping quality. So what exactly is the importance of having simultaneously EB, EBSD and SEI imaging? It is important to understand local phenomena such as TRIP in 3G materials. So EBSD has been used to look at partial transformation of blocky austenite. So as you can see here from zero to seven to 13% in these various areas, you get darkening of these blocky austenites. And that shows just with EBSD that we have this partial transformation. You cannot see that with SEI imaging. As well, it is inefficient to take EBSD measurements at very slight increments of strain. So typically when this material is pulled or deformed ex situ and then subjected to an EBSD scan, it's fairly high strains. And that is not possible to process with DIC software. So you don't actually understand the local strain distribution as a result of that. So I've been recently trying to update this methodology so that we have a one-step electropolish followed by doing a DIC whenever uh, an SEI imaging whenever is needed. So in summary, if you have a tensile specimen, you electropolish, you fib perimeter meal, the area in which you want to perform EBSD or you perform your EBSD, then you perimeter fib mill. You perform your EBSD map to track where your phases of interest are. So in this instance, I'm tracking the retained austenite in this steel material, followed by imaging of the surface. So this material is polished. However, it is also slightly etched in order to get that variation in grayscale values necessary for DIC software. Then these images can be post-processed with DIC software and you can see strain localization in different parts of the map. So now to conclude this study, I'm going to talk about the heating stage capability that is that we have at the CCM. And this heating stage can be actually connected to the automatic tensile stage for heating the material. Um, this heating stage can go up to 710 degrees Celsius and has been used recently by Dr. Zarab and Dr. James PhD student, Shariar, in which he looked at an aluminum material. So first he took his aluminum material, performed in situ SEM tensile testing at room temperature, and again, used the natural surface topography. He was able to use the precipitates on his aluminum material for DIC tracking and to obtain that, uh, those microstrain maps. However, once he heat treated his aluminum material to 400 degrees Celsius, and he solutionized his material, removing any precipitates, he required some sort of speckle pattern and found that the most convenient was etching of the microstructure. So whatever etchant you choose, here the, he chose to use the colors etchant, is highly dependent on the material. And he used that for DIC tracking at the 400 degree solutionizing temperature. So in conclusion, DIC has become a very useful technique to study deformation of materials in pretty much any industry. As I've mentioned before, DIC has been applied in the biological industry, in the geological industry, in different civil applications, in the powder metallurgy industry, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on and at different fields of view. So we have applied DIC with larger fields of view, as well as smaller fields of view and capturing deformation using 
um, highly spatial resolution cameras. As well, there's a variety of techniques of microspectral patterning available. So with this presentation, I just touched on some of the microspectral patterning techniques that can be used to study deformation at a very small field of view and to capture local deformation, but the list can go on and on. So in case study number one, I talked about the etching technique and applying that to look at the joining of materials as well as harmonic structures. And then in case studies two and three, I talked about the microstructure independent technique. So that is applying a speckle to the material, but that has nothing to do with the underlying substrate and instances where that is um, in which you can apply that is using e-beam lithography. So that is using a grid of crosshairs using Gold's deposition or using um, tungsten deposition using the fib, or you could do randomized whole fib milling. So these were the other two examples that I mentioned about in case study number four. And then lastly, in case study number five, you're slightly using the etching technique again, however, now with electropolishing. So you get this, this two-fold um, purpose with the electropolishing technique in which you can acquire EBST images as well as use it for SEI imaging, which you can then post-process with the DIC software. So to conclude my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the following army of people. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, um, the, the Wilkinson Research Group, the KMC Group, the McMaster Machine Shop, as well as our different university collaborators, the CCM members, and as well as Samantha for giving me this opportunity. And that concludes this webinar. Uh, thank you all everyone for listening and I'm, I'm available to take any of your questions. Here's my contact information as well. So thank you. Great, thanks Connie, that was an amazing presentation. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to put it in the chat. Now it's the time to get them answered. Um, so there have been a couple of questions that came in. The first is, is it possible to test ceramics in this setup? Have you had any experience with this? And what would be suitable sample preparation technique for this type of test? Yes. So um, as I've already mentioned, there are multiple uh, microspectral patterning techniques. So it really would depend on the material. So if you'd want to use the most efficient and widely used technique of etching the material and then pulling this material in situ and looking at the ceramic, that would be the most efficient technique. The etchant you would use would highly be material dependent. Um, however, if that doesn't work, and let's say you have very large grains and you'd like to map strain in those very large grains, then you may need to use a combination of microspectral patterning techniques. So for example, you may need to etch the microstructure first, and then in your larger grained areas, you may need to do such as a, uh, a fib deposition or a fib uh, milling pattern. Um, but uh, Dr. Wilkinson has extensive experience using and deforming ceramic materials, so it's definitely possible here in the CCM as well as McMaster. Great. <clears throat> um, which test modes can be run in this system? For example, tension, compression, or bending, just uh, to list a few. Yeah, so in the 6610, we have the capability of pulling the specimen in situ. That is an automatic stage. So we can actually do also compression and fatigue tests using that automatic stage. I personally have not used the automatic stage for uh, compression and fatigue tests, but I do know that it is possible. Um, bending is much more complicated. Um, but we have developed manual jigs to study the bending of materials. So that is definitely a possibility as well. It's just not an automatic stage. Okay. Um, is there any particular materials you find best for microstructure deposition? Um, no, uh, the thing to, to be very that is very important is for microstructure deposition, you want to choose contrasting agent as your depositing agent. So for example, I used a steel substrate and then for my speckle patterns, I used a uh, tungsten speckle. 
because of the drastic difference in atomic number between the underlying iron substrate and the speckles. So we get that contrasting feature. So you just want to make sure that your speckles and your underlying microstructure has a contrast. Um, so that is really all that's needed for DIC software. Great. Um, can you do shear tests uh, with the system? Yes, you can do shear tests. Um, we have done shear testing, of course, with the, the bending tests. Um, you could use notch samples, and that's how you could also see um, the and pull the specimen with a notch specimen and see the shear localization that way. So it's it's definitely possible. Yes. Okay, there's lots of questions coming in. This is exciting. Oh, wow. <laughs> Do you see aluminum silicon coating on the steel post heat treatment? Uh, or sorry, do you think aluminum silicon coating on the steel post heat treatment will affect the test? Um, and aluminum silicon will have different microstructure on the top layer and diffusion layer uh, between the coatings and the base steel. So I guess just to add on to the question. Okay, so I'm pretty sure I understand the first part of the question. If the coating is going to affect um, imaging during pulling. So we have seen that when coating the material, any sort of material, and then pulling and deforming the material, if you're not choosing the appropriate SEM parameters, such as the appropriate KV, then you can actually see the cracking of the coating, and that will add to noise in your microstream map. So as a result of that, you may need to increase your KV to eliminate that effect of the coating cracking. Um, Samantha, would you mind repeating the second part of the question? I think the second part was possibly just more of a statement. They were just saying um, okay. that there's going to be a different microstructure on the top layer and the diffusion layer uh, between the coating and the steel. So is that going to have any effect on the test and kind of what you see? Yeah, so as I already mentioned that um, you need to choose the appropriate SEM parameters as well when doing these tests. And it might require trial and error and looking at different uh, KVs as well as probe currents to optimize this and not get that effect or see that uh, cracking effect of the coding when, when pulling the structure. Okay, and then another question, with the method that you're using, is it possible in a dual phase material to obtain independent strain rates for each phase? That is a good question. Um, I do not believe that that is possible, independent strain rates. We are able to understand strain localization. So as we pull the material at global strains, we can understand how much of that strain is being accommodated by one phase versus the other phase. Um, but to deform the phases at different rates, I don't believe that is possible, no. Okay, and it looks like one last question. Um, it's a bit of a long one. Uh, <laughs> is it possible to do the in situ DIC in 3G steel spot welds? So their area of interest is in the fusion boundary. So do you have any experience in, in that? And what would be your recommendation for understanding this deformation behavior of the fusion boundary um, in steel while you're doing this tensile testing? Perfect. So actually, I can go back to one of the case studies for this. So as I showed in, I believe it was the first case study, we actually looked at an interface. So in one material, it was not as corrosion resistant as this Corax material. So as a result of etching, we got an, un, an uneven edge at the interface and that required like multiple trial and error in order to get that even edge. However, if you don't have time to do that trial and error, what you need to do is have a combination of speckling techniques. So for example, on the more corrosion resistant side, we could do like a fib speckle, whereas on the less corrosion resistant side, you could continue with the etching technique. Um, but it's definitely possible to look at the interface. We, we've done it and it's been published already. 